we had a client who was seriously injured. There was a hundred thousand dollar policy on the other side. And we ultimately, from the insurance company, recovered four million dollars. Hello and welcome to the Attorney Post, where we bring you the inside baseball scoop from top legal experts across the country. I'm your host, Justin. Lewis. All right. Hey guys, welcome back to the Attorney Post, where we discuss what's going on in various facets of the law with lawyers at the top of their game to help you navigate the various ins and outs of the legal fields and jurisdictions. Because as I always say, if you don't know your rights, you don't have any. Today, I'm joined with Andrew Tropp of the eponymous Tropp Law Firm based out of Austin, Texas. Andrew, how are you doing today? Good. How are you? I am doing good. Thank you very much for meeting with me. Um, Andrew uh, runs a website over here, AustinAccidentLawyer.com. He actually has some great resources on there. So if you've been injured, you want to know how to deal with uh, insurance companies, he's got some great advice. We'll be digging into a lot of that today as well. But as always, the link will be in the description down below. That's AustinAccidentLawyer.com. Uh, you can also give him a call at 512-246-9191. Um, before we get started, I'm going to jump over and read from one of our sponsors. Our first sponsor today is actually uh, uh, National ER rc.org. You may have noticed that the world went through a pandemic and many businesses were forced to shut down, reduce hours, and had supply chain interruptions and ultimately suffered from reduced revenue in 2020 and 2021. What you may not know is that Congress recently passed the CARES Act, which allows for $400 billion to be set aside as stimulus funds for small businesses that never needs to be paid back. This is not a loan like the PPP or Paycheck Protection Program. This is free money for your business that can be spent in whatever way you think makes the most sense. Right now, nationalerc.org is helping small businesses get the maximum amount of money that they can and you can calculate and see how much you can get back by visiting nationalerc.org the average small business that they work with gets over two hundred thousand dollars to invest in their business that never needs to be repaid the calculator is free and again there's never a fee unless they get funding for you visit nationalerc.org and then we'll jump back over here so uh how are you doing again andrew good Awesome, awesome. Well, Andrew uh, is a he's a globetrotter. He was actually born in uh, Johannesburg, South Africa. He's lived in Toronto, Canada as a kid, and then he became a native of the nation of Texas when he was 13. He's a husband. He's a father, a graduate of University of Texas. He's got dual degrees in honors business and management, as well as his JD from the Te University of Texas School of Law. He's been operating uh, as the president of his own law firm, the eponymous law firm that bears his name since 2003, where he specializes in helping injured people in Austin and all around Texas get the job that they deserve if they've been hurt due to the negligence of others. He also owns Rapid Register Agent, um, which allows him to basically stand in as a registered agent for different businesses. And when he's not fighting insurance companies, he likes to jog, play tennis, watches UT football, and spends time with his wife, Talia, and their two daughters. So question number one I always like to lead with, Andrew, is what did I miss? I think you covered it pretty well. You know, I was born in South Africa. I did also live in uh, Toronto, Ontario, Canada for six years. Uh, so I have dual citizenship. Um, Wasn't the, that triple citizenship? Because Texas is its own country too, right? Right. I, I suppose so. Texas and U.S. are are two, and then Canada would be three. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I thought that was a pretty pretty good summary of everything. <laughs> My wife was actually born in uh, Wichita Falls, Texas. So I always joke that she's not a national born citizen either. So she's not eligible to run for president. But <laughs> to my Texas listeners, obviously, we're joking. So, um, well, let me let me start with this. Uh, Andrew, can you give our listeners a pitch for your firm? Tell us who your ideal clients are, where they're found, how they find you, what you do for them, et cetera. Give us give us your if we're stuck in an elevator for 30 seconds or a minute. Give me give me your pitch. Well, I mean, what we like to say is that we write wrongs. Uh, our clients are those who have been injured in accidents, uh, typically car accidents, but we also handle truck and motorcycle accidents. Sometimes we also take on people that are injured in slip and fall or even dog bites. Um, so our ideal client is one who is seriously injured. That's who we're going to benefit the most. Someone who's slightly injured or has a little bit of a fender bender isn't necessarily going to benefit from our services. So those are the kind of cases we'll actually turned down because if we can't add value to the case, we don't want to take it on. Okay. That makes sense. And, uh, no, that makes, that makes good sense. So let me ask you this, what got you into law, right? I mean, some people grew up knowing they wanted to be an attorney their whole life. Uh, maybe they even played attorney as a kid, right? Instead of playing house or doctor, or whatever kids play. And some people just kind of stumble into it. Obviously you've got your degrees in, in business. Did you always go into that knowing that you wanted to ultimately be in law or is law something that you kind of accidentally fell into or how that all happen? I mean, it's a good question. So my father was a lawyer in South Africa. He was a top lawyer. 
uh, not a litigation lawyer, but like a contracts kind of lawyer. Um, you know, he graduated from college, uh, high school at 16, college at 18. He had been admitted to Harvard, but he, they couldn't afford to send him there. He went to law school and he graduated top of his class, college and law school, law school at 21. And so there was always this kind of thought as I was growing up from my parents, there was this expectation that I would go into law. Uh, and people would even say to me, are you going to be a lawyer? Because of some of the questions that I asked sometimes. Um, and so I think it was always just assumed. When I went to college, I really didn't know what I wanted to major in. So I picked business. I ended up loving business. Um, it was a major impetus for me forming my first company, which is a computer company. Um, and, and so I didn't actually really have the desire to practice law when I graduated from law school. I really wanted to still uh, be in business, to own a business, to run a business. And so that's what I did. Uh, until about 2001, um, we closed that business after six or seven years. I did some consulting work and then ultimately started the law firm. Um, and, and so that's really how I got into it. It wasn't the first career choice, but it has been my longest career uh, and certainly my most rewarding uh, because I'm able to really help people, uh, really helping the Davids fight against the Goliaths kind of situation. Gotcha. What got you into accident law in particular? So when I started my uh, law firm, it was 2003. I was about eight years after I graduated law school. Uh, and so I kind of had to start on my own, uh, bootstrap myself. And so I tried different areas. I tried uh, real estate. I tried contract law. I tried divorces. I tried estate planning. Um, and they all had various issues. Uh, forming corporations, things like that. They all had, had various issues. They didn't really resonate with my personality, um, you know, contracts, forming corporations. Um, I don't know how to say it, but it's kind of boring. Same thing with real estate. I did bankruptcy work for some clients. That was depressing. Family <laughs> law and divorces, frankly, was also depressing. And I mean, Estate planning was was nice because you would help people. They would they would be uh, that was one thing I, I I still enjoyed. But ultimately, I had to pick one area, and personal injury was the one which really gave me the greatest sense of helping people, the greatest sense of accomplishment, of doing more than just earning a paycheck. Mm -hmm. um, and that was really it. I tell my wife if I couldn't do personal injury, I don't think I could practice law. Uh, there's oh, wow. really not any other area of law that I think uh, would be as enjoyable. It is a lot of fighting. It's a lot of aggravation. I'm constantly either fighting with lawyers or insurance adjusters. So it is stressful. But at the end of the day, you know, sometimes, not always, but sometimes we're really able to get the fantastic result for our clients that we want. Uh, I, I had to happen to be a person that I always want more. So even when I get a good result for my client, I wish I had gotten more. Even when I get the max that could have been obtained, I always wish I could have gotten more, you know? So I really like this area of law. And if, I, if it weren't practicing personal injury, which I've been doing the majority of my career, I don't think I'd be practicing law. Gotcha. My longtime listeners know I've, I've always had a, a long time fascination with injury law. I think it's one of the unique aspects of the law where you're you're feeling a need for people who simply don't have the ability to otherwise have access to law if they had to afford regular attorney hours. I'm told the, the national average 15 years ago, I think it was like $500 an hour. So you're looking at, you know, 500 to a thousand, you're even higher depending upon the, the the niche. And I know that injury law especially can be very time consuming. There's lots of research, lots of depositions and back and forth and, and everything else that goes into settling a case like that. And so for you guys to be able to say, don't worry about the cost, we'll take care of it. And if we don't take care of it, don't worry about the cost. <laughs> I think that's awesome. I've always been a big fan of, of that, that model. Right. I mean, a lot of people don't realize like the Texas state bar did a a survey of uh, different lawyers' incomes uh, on different fields, and uh, injury lawyers weren't even in the top half of of, oh, wow. um, of earners. Um, but of course, you've got a few outliers out there that are advertising on TV, advertising huge verdicts, and throwing around hammers and things like that. And so they tend to make everybody think injury lawyers are greedy and they. 
you know, just want the money and they get a lot of money. But the reality isn't isn't the same. You know, the according to the least the state bar of Texas, their research review. Now that was a few years ago. I don't know if that's changed, but I doubt it's moved from like bottom and a half to top five or whatever. Yeah. Actually, that's fascinating. I've never heard that stat before. So I would love to, maybe in the after hours, I'd love to see that at some point, because that really is kind of a, that's a new one on me. And yeah, I, you know, I, 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 don't know if I have it, but I would Google something like Texas bar um, salary research or salary study, because they that's did. Fine. <laughs> well, if any of you guys listening to this, feel free to uh, share the link in the comments down below. So, <laughs> um, so let me ask you this, Andrew, um, as far as your practice goes, obviously, and I just mentioned with the sponsor we had, we just got through with this little pandemic thing. And uh, I've talked to attorneys across the country. I've talked to attorneys in California, in New York, in Texas, in Florida, uh, and all stops in between. And it's been interesting because everybody has had a different experience of with the pandemic itself, um, whether the lockdowns affected them directly or not, their clients, how they practice law. Um, so as we seem to be hopefully coming out of this for good, um, how how did the pandemic affect you and, and your firm? And, and has it affected it in any way that's carried over into the way you're currently practicing? I mean, it's a good question. Uh, I guess financially, the pandemic caused our uh, our income to look like a V. Uh, so if you look at the two years before and the two years since, it's a V. It's got It went down and we've had to rebound. Um, so we had less cases coming in the door because people weren't driving um, yeah. and less, less injuries. So that's the good side of it. Uh, the bad side of it is those injuries were worse because when people were driving, there was no one on the road and so they were speeding. And so they were getting in higher speed accidents. Um, we did end up trying to work remote uh, and adjust at the beginning. And that was an adjustment. We ended up losing uh, one of our staff members. Uh, but now we have adjusted as a result of the pandemic to being able to have a remote staff member um, and work remotely. Uh, we never had Zoom before. And now we talk to clients through Zoom. We do deposition preparation through Zoom. Our clients are deposed through Zoom. We have had mediations through Zoom. In fact, most mediations have been done that way. So it's changed the way we do law for certain. We never used to use DocuSign, but now since sometimes we don't even meet our clients until they come to pick up their check, yeah. or um, maybe if we go back to mediations or depositions in person. So you know, it's changed the way we interact with clients. Um, so yeah, it's had a pretty large effect on us. Uh, fortunately, we've been able to bounce back from it. That's awesome. Yeah, I've uh, I actually one of the reasons I rebooted the podcast uh, a couple of years ago, back when the pandemic started, was a I had, you know, some spare time <laughs> and B, all of a sudden attorneys knew how to zoom. And I was like, all right, well, let's just do this. Cause I used to have to talk them through like downloading. We used Google Hangouts for a long time and now it's like Google meet or whatever, but you had to download all this stuff to make it work out, which is totally obnoxious. Um, I had another question about the pandemic. I was going to ask you and I just lost it. That's right. It may come to me in a minute, but um, yeah, you know, this is what happens when you're doing a live conversation, right? Things just kind of in, in one ear and out the other. Um Gosh, I was going to ask you, uh, well, I'll come back to it later if I think about it. So let's talk more about your actual practice then. Um, obviously, you've been practicing for almost 20 years now, um, at least in your own firm. And I'm sure in that time you've had successes and I'm sure you've probably had failures as well. I know most people don't want to dwell on the failures. We never want to dwell on failures, but I'm a firm believer that it's only a failure if you don't win, if you don't, if you don't learn from it, right. And you don't, you don't carry something forward. So can you let our listeners know, Andrew, about a time in your practice of law, when you had something that you would consider a failure, it could be a case that didn't go your way. You forgot to fill out a document. The judge just did something stupid. One of your, one of your clients said the wrong thing or whatever it happened to be, but what did you learn from that? And how do you carry that forward to help your clients? Gosh, I think my biggest failure was, um, and I, I, I even still think about it sometimes today, even though it was about. You wake up in 10, a cold sweat. <laughs> eight to 10 years ago. Yeah, it was bad. I had a, a trial for a case with a client who had a good case. Um, he'd hired me at the last minute, so we'd had to file suit. I never understood why it had not settled. Um, and, um, you know, they wouldn't settle. The insurance company wouldn't settle it. It was a small town, and so we went to try the case. And I had tried maybe four or five cases before that, and I went in, and those cases were all in Travis County, where the judge had given me two hours to do jury selection if I needed it. 
and we went in and I never forget the judge said, you've got 40 minutes or 45 minutes, or maybe it was less. And I said, well, I, you know, I really I planned a two hour thing. I need two hours. And he's like, we, we, we only, we don't even give two hours for a death penalty case because in the small counties, they try civil and criminal in the same courtroom. He yeah. said, you get, you know, this amount of time. So I had this list of questions and I went through and I cut out the wrong questions. I cut yeah. out the good questions. And I left the bad questions in and I go through the jury selection and I'm asking the questions. It's not the order I wanted. It's not the questions I wanted in the order that I wanted. And um, at one point I just really messed up in front of the jury um, in, in front of this panel. It was about 40, 55 people there, 40, 50 people. So I had like, if you figure it out, I, I had like less than a minute per person. Yeah. So the judge has given me and I'm all panicky and I, I just did not do a good jury selection. And I think as a result of that, the jury um, hated me. They did not mm. like me. Um, they did not trust me. And that was not a good feeling. Yeah, um, but I, I still continue to try the case for my client as best as I could. We had great witnesses, but they weren't available to come in when they should have. And so I had to call the weaker witnesses first, which gave the other attorney a chance to pounce on them. So the end result was not a great verdict. Um, it was awful. I felt really bad for my client, for my family, which I felt depended on me. Um, I went home. I think uh, I cried for two days in the closet. <laughs> <laughs> it was not good. I thought about quitting the practice of law. I thought if I can't, if I can't, this is a worthy client. He's a deserving client. And if this is the result I get, I don't think I should be practicing. I either got to up my game or I got to get out of the practice of law because I can't, I can't practice other fields and I can't, I can't, I can't be doing this. I can't be having this kind of result. So um, I ended up ultimately obviously staying. I went to a whole two day weekend seminar just on jury selection, uh, changed the way I approach it, the way I do it, um, to not be like the brave front, but to be vulnerable if I needed to be, mm -hmm. um, in front of people, which I guess is so important as a lawyer. And, um, it turned things around I my mean, next Several trials were all fantastic verdicts. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been good, but I still think back. I feel like I let that client down. I feel horrible about it. It was, it was a bad experience and fortunately one that won't be repeated. Yeah. <laughs> so let me ask you this. Have you ever been on a jury yourself? I've always been kind of intrigued by attorneys who practice law, uh, trial law and they have to be in front of a jury on a regular basis. And, and very few of them have, have ever actually sat on a jury. And a lot of times they have specific ideas about whether that's a good idea or a bad idea. But have you ever served on a jury yourself? And do you think that it's a good thing for an attorney to be able to sit on a, on a, on a panel, on a jury? I would love to. I've been summoned three times, but in all three of them, the week before the jury uh, has been canceled and they've been notified me that the summons has been canceled. So I've never sat on a jury. I've never even sat in a jury selection. I never even got to the point where they ask questions. That being said, my last three trials have all had attorneys on them. Uh, hmm. And every single case, the attorney would have played a significant role in the verdict. Um, and that could be good or bad, depending on the attorney. So I've got to be careful about that. Uh, but I myself, unfortunately, have never been in that position. I would love to sit on the other end of that uh, and to see what that's what's like from a, you know, the LA person's point of view. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, I've heard people have very mixed feelings on that. Some are like, I would never want an attorney on my jury because they would, you know, steal the court one way or the other and, and whatnot. True. But I could see a real a real benefit from being on that end yourself and you know, knowing what it's like to sit in the in the in the jury box, you know, maybe even be the foreman or 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 whatnot. So it's kind of a fascinating concept. I've I've been called twice and I've never had a chance to serve in the the second time I got I, I got called, we I, my wife's from Pennsylvania, so we we head out there. Um, 
a couple times a year and we we leave like mid December and get back like early January and I got back to a a letter in my my mailbox that said I was in contempt of court <laughs> like what, what? <laughs> and apparently I mean, they they call quickly and they expect you to show up like that week like there's no real turnaround time so I never showed up for court for some sort of a case that would have been tried over like early January like like we're talking New Year's time or whatever <laughs> I found myself in in contempt of court so but that one I guess didn't wind up going to court anyway but I because I didn't show up that was the issue you know and so it's it showed up I got punished but they're they they're like oh you were out of town that's fine so but anyway that's my experience that's my only experience with jury jury duty as well i'd be happy to be on a jury as well i think it'd be kind of a neat experience to i heard you know. it's a really good experience like a lot of people it's like the second as long as it's not one of those like eight month cases <laughs> yeah like you know as you know serving your country in the military is considered the greatest honor but i've heard a lot of people say that being on a jury is the second, you know, you serve yeah. a civic duty where you're helping your neighbors, uh, people in your community without really reward. Uh, and it's, you know, not holding democracy. It's one of the things that really makes American uh, court system different from anywhere else in the world is that the community decides the cases, not some judge, but really the community, 12 people who don't know anybody uh, either side um, who say they can be fair, neutral, and not start out for one side or the other, coming together, together and having to work to reach a decision on sometimes complex cases, sometimes easy cases, but reach a verdict together. Um, it's supposed to be very rewarding and fulfilling. So I'm yep. looking forward to the day I can do it. I don't know if that will happen, but... <laughs> I've talked to a couple of attorneys who actually say they've been called and they get kicked off all the time too because they're an attorney. And the other attorney's like, oh, I don't want an attorney on my on my jury. So we'll see. Maybe you'll get there one of these days. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask. So here's the flip side of what the question I had a minute ago, uh, which obviously is what's one of your, your biggest failures. And it, I'm sure that, again, wake up in the cold sweats, right? Um, but I'm sure you've also had a couple of, of cases that you would consider the feathers in your cap, right? The the ones you're most proud of, the things that when you think about what you do, you just be maybe, and maybe it wasn't the size of a settlement or, you know, a judgment, you know, but maybe it was these people were just in a really bad position. But can you, can you let our listeners know, Andrew, about a couple of the, a couple of the cases you've had that are really ones that you're proud of that they're, they're again, the, the feathers in your cap, so to speak. I guess, you know, so uh, you should understand that in personal injury law, a lot of times, there's caps on what can be recovered. And I don't mean like med mal where there's a 250,000 statutory cap. I mean a cap in terms of how much insurance is available. So, you know, I've had clients that were hit, seriously, seriously injured, and the other driver had $30,000 coverage. But there's not a lot you could do for that. And that's really depressing. That's really, there you're spending your time negotiating reductions on their bills or their liens. Mm -hmm. So that's a difficult case. But what I'm most proud of is pretty much at least once a year, going back many years, we've recovered more than that for our clients. Um, it does take some luck. It requires the insurance company to screw up in some sense. Um, but we've had that many times over where, um, you know, injured, there was a $100,000 policy on the other side. And we ultimately, from the insurance company, recovered $4 million. They're fighting it like the Dickens. It's in appeals right now. They've lost on everything three times in a row. So now they're appealing. Um, so it hasn't even gone to trial. Um, but that case, there was a $30,000 policy. And, you know, it also could settle for $4 million or more, um, wow. depending on how the appeals court goes. Um, but, you know, those are the things I'm really most proud of is where I can really get justice for the client in spite of the limitations of the insurance that's available. Um, because a lot of times, you know, a lot of attorneys will get policy limits and that's nice, but there's nothing special about getting the policy limits. Uh, yeah. a lot of attorneys can do that, but not a lot of attorneys have the knowledge and the fortitude to go after more than the policy limits when they see a mistake to to chase after the insurance company and say you know this isn't right and because of what you've done now you essentially uncap the policy and you need to pay my client full justice not the amount of the policy but the amount they're really owed for their injuries and so i think that's one of the things 
that I'm most proud of and also that separates us, I think, from a lot of other law firms is that we recognize those situations and we've, we've capitalized them on pretty much at least once a year. We're getting an in excess uh, uh, payment for our client. Gotcha. That's really neat. So I don't know if you don't have to give away the secret sauce, obviously. And if there's anybody out there on the insurance side listening to this, you know, I don't want you to tell them how to pregame to prevent this, but what kind of a mistake can they make that could make you go from, you know, 30,000 or a hundred thousand cap to, to 4 million? Like that seems like a huge jump. I don't know if you can share that. Well, it, it in Texas is something called the Stowers doctrine or Star Wars doc, doctrine. Sorry. And it's a way of creating a demand letter. And if they do not accept the demand under the terms uh, of the Stowers demand, they then can expose their insured to an excess judgment. So the way insurance works, it's a little bit wonky for most people to understand, but when you're injured in a car accident or a truck accident or motorcycle, or a dog bite or slip and fall. You don't get to sue the insurance company for the person that injured you. You have to sue the person that injured you. And that's because you don't have any arrangement with their insurance company, only they do. They have a contractual relationship with their insurance company. And their insurance company is bound to defend them and pay any judgments up to the policy limits. But the insurance company also has the right to settle without your permission if you're the insured uh, for up to the amount of the policy limits. So what happens in the Stowers demand is the demand is made and the insurance company, which has the right to settle it, does something wrong and doesn't accept the terms of the settlement. Once they do that, they've now potentially breached their duty to their insured, the person who bought the policy. And so what that means is there, if there's an excess judgment against the insured, their insured can then turn around and sue the insurance company, not only for the excess amount, but for fraud, uh, breach of the insurance code, deceptive trade practices, and get attorney's fees. So they're in a great position to go after the insurance company. Most insurance companies don't want to be in that situation. Mm -hmm. So if there's something where they know they've messed up and they know there's a big amount that they're going to end up on the hook for, they go ahead and settle it. And that's what we've done without giving away too much of the secret sauce because there is um, some of the work that has to go in beforehand that we have to do to line up our ducks. But once we do that, we send it out. If they, you know, screw up and it does take them messing up, but if they mess up, then we we go okay, you know they've messed up, and now we we need to go after the full amount that our client is due. Gotcha, that's really neat. Like again, I've heard of this happening, and I always have wondered. And I talk to attorneys, and it's, I know it's different in different jurisdictions, different states, different areas, and everything else. But to be able to hear, you know, there's a cap on what you can get. Some places it's like ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars, and like if you had a major catastrophic event, that's that's not enough to cover hardly anything. So let me ask you, here's just a related question. I know you said some of these are in appeals right now. How long does the average case take, especially a case like this, You know, especially if you're going through the appeals process? And does the person, if, if you've won the case and then the insurance company or whoever goes into appeals, do they see that money then? Or does it have to wait until that whole process is worn out? Are they waiting years in order to, to get their, their compensation? Or, or how does that play out? So in the terms of when we get the excess uh, excess settlement, the shortest one I would say there is probably a year to two. The one that's ongoing right now with appeal is a 2017 case. So we were talking about five, almost six years. Mm. Um, and that appeal was filed only recently. So that can take up to a year till we get the result from that back. Um, the other case, which settled for um, $4 million, that settled while the insurance company was appealing to the Texas Supreme Court. So we had won through the appellate level and then they appealed to the Supreme Court and then asked us to mediate because there's a, a gap there. So there's a gap of time where probably the Supreme Court wouldn't have picked them up and then in which case we would have been in a very good position, but there was a possibility the Supreme Court would pick it up because they hired an ex-Supreme Court justice 
to hire to, to file the appeal for them, which must have cost just a hundred thousand dollars just to hire him. Yeah. But, you know, that's what insurance companies can't afford and what they do. And so I felt pretty good about it, about going forward and waiting for the Supreme Court to decide. Um, but my co-counsel uh, were more cautious. They said, let's go ahead and go to the mediation. And we settled there for the $4 million. Had it gone forward and the Supreme Court picked it up on the med, you know, we could have got poured out and got zero. Or yeah. if they didn't pick it up, you maybe would have been able to settle for 10 million. I don't know. Um, so that was a calculated kind of risk where we, we, we talked to the clients and, you know, they were aware could go zero, could go this, you know, <laughs> or settle today and have a surety. And so, you know, they, they settled for, for, you know, it's a, it's a pretty good money, but even then I'm like, I wish I'd gotten more for that. You know, yeah. I still feel like I wish I'd gotten more, but most cases, which are, don't go into these categories. Like I say, you know, we probably handle in one year, we will settle anywhere from probably 20 to 30 cases. We don't do high volume. And, and so maybe we get one of, one of those a year. Of those other 20 to 30 cases, of the 19 to 29, you know, most cases, the minimum time frame is going to be uh, six months. There are exceptions to that. Um, Let's say you lost your leg in an accident and it was a $30,000 policy, you would not take six months or a year to get that. I mean, that would be pretty quick. Um, if it were um, a different case, soft tissue injury, you have to go to the doctor. Um, it may take several months to get treatment. If the pain doesn't go away, then they had to send the MRI, then maybe pain management. Then they're talking about surgery. Then we're talking about that could go into two years, three years, four years. So if a case doesn't go to litigation, usually it's it's resolved in a year. If a case goes into litigation, it's usually talking, you're talking four years to get to either a verdict or a settlement. It's not a quick process. I have to tell clients all the time, the law does not move quickly, especially if we have to file suit because there's certain time allotments that we can't speed up. That the law says, you know, they have this much time to do this and this much time to do that. I mean, we might have all our ducks lined up in a row and get ready to go to trial when we file the suit, but the defense still gets to do their stuff and that can take drag on things for months. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And it's frustrating when you have to work at the speed of bureaucracy, but I guess most of us have that experience at some point. Right. <laughs> so other than the speed of a trial, what's what would you say when people come to you, maybe they're looking for help and you know they don't know if they're working with you or not or, or what the situation is, but what would you say is one of the biggest misconceptions people have about what it is you do or can do for them? Um, you know, and, and, and what advice would you give to somebody that was looking for a, an injury attorney, particularly obviously in your area, but just in general? So I think, you know, one of the biggest things that people have a misconception about is going after the insurance company. And um, I think we kind of touched on that where, you know, a lot of people think you're going to sue the insurance company. They don't really realize, oh, we've got to sue this individual. Uh, and they're always like, well, I don't want to go after that person. I don't want them to pay me out of their pocket. I don't want this to be a big debt on them. We have to explain we're suing them, but their insurance company is paying whatever judgment we get. You know, it's not a thing where we are going after them. We never really go after people's personal savings or their own money. We only really file suit if there's insurance available because we're expecting the insurance company to pay the judgment, whether that's large or small, because we either set it up where it could be large or it is what it is. It's a smaller policy and we're expecting them to pay for it. But we don't really ever expect individuals to pay, even though that's who shows up as in court. It's not the insurance company. It's the individual driver with his or her lawyer. So that's one of the biggest misconceptions people have. And it leads them to some hesitancy to file suit. Uh, and we have to explain, no, the insurance companies, even though they're not named, even though the jury never hears about them, they're the hidden force that's really paying the judgment. And we're not going after this person's savings. They're not going to lose their job. You know, they're not going to have any big lien on their house or anything like that. We just, we just don't even do that. I would say the one time we have gone after an individual's um, 
savings was when we had one of these situations where they could have been of Lone Stowers, they were arguing with me, and we were arguing with them, and we got down to where we were willing to settle for maybe five or 10,000 above the policy limits, and they got their insured to pay it. We kind of expected the insurance company to pay it, but they got their insured. And the reason we were really insisting on this higher amount was because the person who hit them was a drunk driver. Mm. So I didn't really feel bad about making a drunk driver pay some money out of his pocket uh, for causing my client, you know, a mild traumatic brain injury, um, even though he had insurance and insurance should have paid the money up front. I feel like maybe even paying some money out of pocket will also be a deterrent rather than just his insurance rates going up. Absolutely. There's, 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 there's justice in that, you know, (laughs) absolutely. Absolutely. Well, here in a minute, um, we're going to change tones and I'm going to give you my magical pen. My longtime listeners understand that it's actually a different pen than I used to use. This one's actually branded to my company, which is really neat. Uh, But this pen has magical powers. And uh, amongst the magical powers is this pen can allow you to go back in time and uh, maybe meet a young Andrew fresh out of uh, fresh out of uh, getting his JD or fresh out of college and give him some advice other than, of course, you know, buy a lot of Bitcoin. Trust me. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And it also allows you to change laws. You can you can strike a law from the books. Uh, you can edit a law that's on the books, or you can add a law that's not currently on the books. And this can have, you know, nationwide, maybe even global sweeping, you know, ramifications, or it can just be that stupid law that makes you fill out forms and triplicates. So in a minute, I'm going to ask you that question. Before I do that, though, I'm going to jump over and take a look at your site again. Uh, that is austinaccidentlawyer.com. If you guys want to go look Andrew up, uh, Traub Law Office, uh, 5124. Uh, sorry, 246-9191, as always, link down below in the description, as well as link to his phone number. And my understanding is, of course, you probably do a free consultation if people want to pick up the phone and, and, and give you calls. Is that right? Right. We have free consultations. Our phones are answered 24-7, and we work on contingency fees, which means we don't recover anything. We don't pay us any uh, legal fees, and we also don't ask for any expenses back. So we'll front the money to develop the case. And if we don't make a recovery for whatever reason, you don't pay us that money back. That's awesome. Again, that's one of the reasons I love working with injury attorneys. I think you guys, you really make law accessible to people, which is great. Um, I'm going to jump over really quickly and take a look at Groove Funnels. Um, this is Groove Funnels right here. If you love spending $5,000 to build a brand new website and you love paying $100 a month to host on a platform that allows you to sell a product to your potential customers or clients, then by all means, keep doing whatever it is you're doing. But if you're like me, you hate that. And that's why I personally recommend Groove Pages, the all new, all in one website funnel sales platform from internet marketing legend Mike Phil Same. Visit theattorneypost.com slash Groove to sign up for free and build a complete site at no cost, really at no cost. There's literally no cost to do this. You can build actually, I believe, up to three different uh, websites, and it's got drag and drop functionality. It's easily customizable. It's kind of a Swiss Army knife that replaces a lot of the different things you've used in the past. If you've used a, a mailing platform, a sales platform, a website building platform, a blogging platform, it kind of replaces just about everything you could look for in, in a website. It's kind of a Swiss Army tool. So visit theattorneypost.com slash groove. That's theattorneypost.com slash groove to sign up for free and get access to all of these things today all right there we go oh, that's funny so i, I happen to that? know i know all of mike phil same i don't know him but i know all of him uh, yeah yeah he's he's been around for a long time uh i work in the internet marketing space i have for years i've been very familiar with him for uh, well over a decade at this point he and uh his, his his partner for a long time i don't know if they're together still or not but andy jenkins they used to they'd like a webinar hosting platform and what was it webinar jam i think is what it was so Good guys. They're, they're very fun. Well, so. Andy feels same also, I guess. Uh, yeah. I, I remember I even had the Mike Phil Sane's butterfly marketing uh, 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 website software at one point. Oh, there you go. <laughs> it's a small world. We're all oh, interconnected yeah. in a roundabout way. Yeah. And um, I was even a member of Andy Jenkins. Was it Andy Jenkins? No. Yeah. I'm thinking Michael of someone Seaman. else. Yes. Yeah, so Andy Jenkins. I do know of him as well, but I was thinking of, um, there's a guy out of Australia used to run the immediate edge uh, his name for um i don't think that's around anymore but his name uh, slips my mind but yeah i know of all these internet marketers you're talking about it's, it's so <laughs> that's awesome it's a small world right um all right so magic pen time um we're going to travel back in time meet a young andrew trump just fresh out of law school what advice would you give yourself and obviously by extension you know a law school student who's just now you know starting off you know, maybe looking at working for a firm or starting their own practice what advice would you give yourself 
I mean, I guess I would have gone straight into personal injury. Um, I, I didn't really dip my toes into personal injury until 2007, went fully into personal injury, I think 2009. Knowing what I know now, I would have probably gone straight into um, personal injury and not practice any other area. Um, that I think would have, would have been nicer. I probably also would have started right out of law school instead of eight years after law school. Um, <laughs> you know, when I ran the computer company, I was working like a dog. I was working 80 hours a week, Monday through Saturday with only Sunday off. Uh, I loved it. It was fun. I was young. I could work a lot like that. And, uh, it was exciting and I liked helping people. I like teaching people. Um, but, you know, building PCs and delivering products and, you know, it, that didn't have the fulfillment level that, um, you know, service, a service business does, uh, where you're directly working with people on a long-term basis, not just a, a simple transactional basis. And so, yeah, I would have probably also gone straight into law, practice personal injury. Those are the two things I think I would like to t go back in time and tell myself. Um, you know, that's fine. That is great advice. It's, it's very specifically personalized for you. And hey, if you're fresh out of law school, consider PI, right? Right. Uh, <laughs> if you want so, something fulfilling, but you know, a lot of people think, okay, I want to do criminal defense. I mean, if that's what is in your heart, that's what you should do. You know, I, yeah. I could never do that just because I was a victim of, of so many break-ins when we had our computer company. Um, but you know, if you always want to be a patent lawyer, go for that. You know, that that's, I didn't have an idea what area of law I wanted to practice. That's why I stumbled about, that's why I would say for me to go back in time, that's what I would do again. Um, it sounds, you know, it sounds like the setup for like a, an Alfred Hitchcock. There's that movie that I, I confess that he did, where it's like a priest who saw the murderer, but he couldn't break the seal of confession. And so he almost gets, you know, arrested for the crime. So uh, an attorney that runs a computer store and winds up having to do the criminal law for the client that broke into his own store. <laughs> <laughs> That would be a good time. Um, it's good advice, though. Good advice. Do do something that's meaningful. And I, I could definitely understand. You know, for some people, I've talked to criminal defense attorneys all the time, like where you find real meaning. And, and you know, it's part of the civic duty. Everyone gets a free hearing. Everyone gets a fair shake, you know, in 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 our, our system of law. And I think that's a good thing. But I, I personally understand. I think I would find that hard to do as well. I, dealt, I actually talked to a lady just last week who is an attorney that does um, like child abuse and neglect cases. And I, I think that would be simultaneously very rewarding, but just terrifying. Like, I think I would hate having to deal with that. I, I don't, I don't know that I have got the fortitude, <laughs> the intestinal fortitude to deal with that on a regular basis without just losing all hope in humanity. But I'm glad that there's people out there that, that clearly are able to do those things. Cause that's, yes. that's very necessary. Um, so maybe, maybe a more fun topic, magical pin again, I'm going to hand it to you now. And with this pen, again, you can strike a law from the books. You can edit a law or you can add a new one. What law, Andrew, would you change and why? That's a good question. I can, I I think, can cue the Jeopardy music in the background if you need. <laughs> I, I think if I had to strike a law, it would be these really stupid caps on medical malpractice. And the reason I say that is... I don't really engage in medical malpractice, uh, mm -hmm. personal injury side. We refer those out to um, another law firm that we work with that does. They have yet to pick up a case that we've referred to them. And the reason is it's so difficult. These are very difficult cases because just to file the lawsuit, you need to have an expert hired who's going to say, and it has to be a doctor, of course, in the same specialty area, say that this other doctor was negligent. So you need an expert. You're going to spend thousands of dollars or tens of thousands of dollars, hire an expert before you can even file a lawsuit to say the other attorney, the other, law, the other doctor was, was negligent. So what that also requires is people can't come to you at the last minute. They can't come to you even six months before the statute of limitations runs. They've really got to come to you within that first year to give you yeah. enough time to get all the medical records for them to review. So it shortens the time frame that they have to uh, to respond, then you, to gather the information and then get the expert. Then if you get the expert and you file suit, your damages are capped at $250,000. And that $250,000 was an amount that was decided in 2003, so almost 20 years ago. So it's not been adjusted for inflation. 
there's nothing extra if the doctor was high on cocaine or drunk or whatever. And so you're talking about people that can be seriously, seriously injured, lifelong injuries. Uh, and the most they can get is $250,000 for the pain and suffering. And what does that do? It means the attorneys have no, and the insurance companies know about this cap. So the insurance companies figure the war stay in court, they're going to pay $250,000. So they defend everything. They don't settle anything. And they make it as difficult and expensive for the plaintiff's lawyer as possible. And so the plaintiff's lawyer is now just maybe paying $100,000 for experts to try the case, only to recover two fifty. dollars Then they take their fees out. Then they got to get to recover their expenses. And what's left for the, the plaintiff is not a lot. So in those cases where the primary uh, injury is severe, the the recovery can be 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 limited. It's a horrible law. Why should doctors get if if a doctor cut off the wrong leg? Yeah. Why should your damages be capped at two hundred fifty thousand dollars? Whereas if you drove into that doctor and he lost his leg, there's no cap on what he could recover from you. There's no cap saying the doctor who lost his legs now should only be entitled to two hundred fifty thousand for pain and suffering. Now, I'm simplifying because, of course, people can recover for future medical, past mm -hmm. medical, um, but those things go to other people. Those things like your past medical expenses, those just pay your doctor or your health yeah. insurance. And your future medical, that's for your future doctor needs. So, you know, it's, 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 it's a horrible, horrible law. It limits what people can recover. And when those people can't recover, if they can't find a lawyer and they can't recover, who pays for that? What we do as a society, we end up paying for the person who becomes homeless because they can't work because they were injured by this negligent doctor. I have a case right now. I referred to these med mal attorneys. They think that the malpractice is fairly clear. This young, young woman, uh, permanently injured, uh, permanent nerve damage, um, on disability, may not be able to work. To work. Um, but they don't think there's a case there because A, she's got disability insurance to pay for her lost wages, and then her her um, her pain and suffering is capped at 250. And and they sound like a lot to people, but it's it's really not when you consider the risk that the attorneys have to take and the expenses they're gonna have to, to spend to develop the case. And so even though that law doesn't really affect me on a day-to-day -day basis, I just irritates me so much. It's a, you know, the Supreme Court of Florida had a, they, so Florida had a, had a similar law and the Supreme Court of Florida is not ever one I would uphold as a model of um, uh, defender of, of the individual as opposed to the corporation. They struck it down. They realized this is unfair and it's a result of tort reform without any real basis. Mm -hmm. And so they struck it down, but we're still stuck with it in Texas and it's a horrible, horrible law. I think John Hopkins put out a study a while back um, that I encountered that said that malpractice, medical malpractice could feasibly be like the third leading cause of death in our country, somewhere yes. between like a quarter of a million and almost a half a million people every year die, probably related to medical malpractice. And that's not to mention the people that are injured by it, which I'm sure is more significantly more than the people that die from it. So the, the fact that you can just say, well, you're, you're SOL. <laughs> right. And that even terrible. brings up something I didn't even touch upon, which is the other side of injury law is meant to be not just compensate the victim, but is to deter the person uh, who, who, did, who did the act that, that injured that person. And so if the doctors are never held to account, um, you know, they don't have any incentive to change the way they practice to, to make sure they don't make that mistake again. And so, you know, that's another side of that. There's any law that, that puts caps. That's another side of it that it, 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 it reduces that deterrent incentive and you do have a lot of people continue to get injured or continue to get hurt i mean i don't know if you've ever read seen the podcast about dr death you know this guy in in um in dallas this this surgeon who's just this horrible surgeon who injured and killed people you know and um those people will never get adequate compensation and his you know his punishment wasn't really the civil side so much as the criminal side they finally caught up with him but even then he's appealing that so yeah. you know it's it's a it's a horrible law, and 
you know, we've got to do something to protect the people who go to the hospital and go to the doctors, you know, not just the doctors. Yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. I think I agree with you 100% on that one. And again, that's a stat I've been familiar with for a while. And so whenever I hear that, I'm just like, yeah, that's not that's not right. I know a lot of states don't have that sort of a cap, but it sounds like you do down there in, yeah, in the nation of Texas. So <laughs> hopefully we can get that changed at some point. Well, Andrew, I'm going to thank you very much for taking time to talk with me and, and uh, my listeners today. As always, I like to give my guests the, the final word. Is there any any parting thoughts or any any words of wisdom you'd like to, to leave our listeners with today? Well, I guess I would say if you are injured, you need to hire an attorney. I would say take your time to find an attorney. It's an important decision. It's not one to be made lightly. It's not one thing you can even back out of easily. If you hire the wrong lawyer, it may be very difficult to get the case back from that lawyer and take it to another attorney. That's why we offer free resources on our website that help you choose an attorney. Um, and so I would say take your time, research, find out what you need. Don't just hire somebody because they uh, have a funny commercial or a good commercial on TV, but really look into it. Um, we've got a ton of resources on our website that are free. Um, you can talk to us for free and let us know if you have questions. Even if you're not in practicing Texas, we may be able to help you find an attorney in your state. That's great advice. That's awesome. Thank you very much for that. Well, Andrew, thank you very much for talking with me today. Again, I really do appreciate your time and uh, we'll get this uh, episode up here. Uh, for those of you listening, this was recorded like two days before Thanksgiving. So uh, hopefully we'll have this up uh, over the holiday. But uh, Andrew, I wish you uh, and your family the, the a safe and happy uh, Thanksgiving day as well. Um, as always, this has been the Attorney Post. I've been chatting with attorney Andrew Traub of the eponymous law firm that bears his name down there in uh, in Austin, Texas. You can look him up online at austinaccidentlawyer.com. As always, link in the description below. As always, this podcast, though we've been talking about legal issues, does not constitute legal advice. And if you ever have a legal issue, you should always seek the advice of a competent attorney in your area who focuses on the matter at hand. Obviously, if you live in the Texas or the Austin area um, and you've got a, an injury issue, uh, I think that uh, the the Austin AustinAccidentLawyer.com would be a great resource to go to. And, and Andrew seems like he has a great head on his shoulders and would be a great resource as well. Um, so highly recommend him. Link, as always, in the description down below. That being said, again, this is Justin with The Attorney Post. Thank you guys for watching. If you're on YouTube, give us a like, subscribe, and a share. If you're watching this on Apple, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, whatever it is, feel free to rate us there as well. And remember, if you don't know your rights, you don't have any. So thanks for watching, guys. And until next time, hopefully you had a safe and happy Thanksgiving. Bye-bye.